Welcome everyone to the Industry Leader Workshop Series with Infopreneur Agency. I'm your host, Omar Briones, and today we have Andre Minkoff from TrademarkFactory.com. He is a uh, full-time uh, entrepreneur who helps, uh, he's actually a former lawyer. He'll probably tell you a little, little more about his story, but um, he's helped clients with their intellectual property and trademarking uh, law with uh, clients like Apple, Microsoft, and uh, even best-selling authors like J.K. Rowling. So you're in really good hands. This is uh, Andre. Andre is one of the best of the best in the world at what he does, and he's going to teach you today how to protect your brand, your your logo, your trademark, and the the intellectual property that you have in your business to make sure that you do things uh, legitimately and uh, you don't risk any any uh, unfortunate lawsuits that come in the future. Now, with that said, we're going to have an open Q&A at the end of the call. So make sure if you have any questions about your trademarks or your business or your brand, uh, make sure you have that ready to put in the, in the chat box, okay? So uh, with that said, we're going to take it over. Uh, I'm going to let Andre take it over from here. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, well, uh, may, one more thing. Make sure you take lots of notes, okay, guys? All right, Andre, go ahead. All right, cool. So Omar, you take uh, take care of the chat box and the and the questions. If you see something relevant in the middle, you're welcome to uh, kind of chime in. But, uh, All right, I'm gonna take it from here. Okay, All perfect. Right. So again, welcome everyone. Thanks for showing up. And uh, just to make sure we're in the right place, uh, this webinar really is for you if you're already running a business, if you've just started a business, let's say less than six months ago, or if you're only thinking of starting a business. Unless, of course, you treat your business as a hobby, as a temporary way to make ends meet until you find a job, or as a get rich overnight scheme because in that in that case that's not for you and uh i hope that you know you 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 all fit the description at the top of the screen and none of you fit the description at the bottom of the screen which what i'm going to teach you is how your brand can help you rich millions of people build a business of your dreams leave a legacy and avoid getting in the middle of a nasty trademark infringement lawsuit we're all in the right room Yes, we are. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so you might be thinking, what is, uh, what is Andre going to try to sell to us today? And uh, well, I'm actually not going to try to sell you anything. What I am going to sell you on is a very simple idea that if it's worth promoting, it's worth protecting. If your brand is worth building and developing, you might as well own it. But don't just listen to me. I want to use a few quotes from the true rock stars. Paul Stanley uh, of KISS has uh, recently said, when we wanted to go out and do the hottest show on Earth tour, Ringling Brothers came to us and said, you can't do that. So when I came up with this idea for the name End of the Road, I thought, let's make sure we can tie this up. So they trademarked it before they announced the tour. They haven't even announced the tour yet, but they've trademarked the name. Oprah said, to legally protect my brand, I trademarked every one of my companies and there are many subsidiaries and my legal team actively pursues those who infringe upon my trademarks. Damon John, just a few months at the, uh, just a few months ago at the Traffic and Conversion Conference said, FUBU had 50 patents. They cost me by the time I was done $700,000. I never made a dime off of them because people can't alter them but you can never use the word FUBU anywhere in the world. And a universal trademark cost $50,000, but I started off with just 2,500. And uh, Gene Simmons, also of Kiz, has said, if I could, I would trademark the air you breathe, every breath, yes, I would. <laughs> I hope everyone's awake right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, to those of you wondering who the hell is Andre, uh, do you mind if I share a little bit of my story with you guys? Yes, definitely. Go ahead. All right, cool. Thank you. Since day one, and I've been in the intellectual property field for over 20 years, since day one, it was all a lot more than business to me. It was always personal. And here's why. 
I was five years old when my father, a famous Russian composer, Mark Minkov, first asked me to join him on stage and uh, sing a couple of his songs. And uh, what you're seeing is uh, it's a clip from TV. I was probably about seven or eight here. And oh, actually, it's 85, so it's 10. Well, I didn't realize that. So uh, he asked me, and like every son who admires his father, of course I said yes. And then 16 years later, he asked me if I could help him sue a radio station that stole one of those songs and made an ad out of that for Samsung. And if you're wondering why he'd ask a, uh, you know, why, why he'd ask a 21 year old, uh, a, a 19 year old to go to court and uh, sue a radio station for copyright infringement, it's uh, because at that time I was still living in Russia still attending a law school there. And uh, honestly, like every son who admires his father, of course I said, yes. The problem with that was, I had three problems. My number one problem was, I had no idea about intellectual property. I can guarantee that each of every one of you on this webinar today knows more about intellectual property now than I used to know back then. My second problem was I had no idea what to do in a courtroom. I had never been in one. And uh, the biggest problem, the biggest challenge was that Larry and Sergey hadn't bothered to create Google. So you couldn't just go online and search for how do you see a radio station that stole your father's music. I had to figure it all out, figure it all out by myself. Long story short, Oh, and by the way, here's another problem that I used to have. That's my driver's license from back then. That's, I never owned a suit. I just had long hair. Right? And uh, never the, nevertheless, we, we went out to the court, uh, and I ripped them apart, and then they bought the judge. And uh, I will always remember this. I was sitting in my room reading that decision where the judge said that uh, even though they infringed, they didn't infringe, and so they didn't have to pay. So my dad came into my room and said, so what are you going to do now? Like, I have no idea. I think I've done everything I should have done. And uh, he said, if you're not going to appeal this loss, if, if, if you're not going to appeal this decision, you should quit your law school and find yourself a different profession. This is when it really got personal. And uh, so I appealed this. I had to take this case all the way up to one level below Supreme Court of Russia, my very first case where I eventually won. But I saw firsthand what it does to you, uh, what it does to your life, what it does to your productivity, what it, you know, what it does to your spirit when somebody's trying to steal that which you pour your heart and soul into. So I've been doing intellectual property ever since. And my dad has been, well, was my first and favorite client. But uh, I've since helped thousands upon thousands of clients ranging from you know, tiny little startups and authors that nobody's ever heard of to multi-billion dollar companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, many, 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 many others. I can't name a lot of them because of confidentiality reasons uh, to um, celebrities like J.K. Rowling. And, and really, regardless of their size and regardless of the size of their wallets, what was driving me was an opportunity to help them protect that which, that which only exists because they had created it, their intellectual property. And that passion is what's still driving me today. In fact, that's what drove me 11 years ago to leave Russia, to leave my high paying job at the largest international law firm in the world and uh, move to Canada. Basically to start everything from scratch. I had to go back to law school for three years and that's, my uh, graduation photograph from uh, my uh, graduation in Canada. And first thing I did when I graduated is I realized that nobody wanted to hire me, even though I finished top of my class. And uh, that's where my entrepreneurial journey began because I started my own law firm, which at that point was creatively called Mink of Law Corporation. <laughs> and uh, 
the first thing I realized is that my success with that business would have very little to do with my brilliance and my excellence as a lawyer and everything to do with my abilities as a marketer and a sales guy. And truth be told, at that time, I had none of those abilities. So I started reading tons of books, going to seminars, webinars, until I came up with this idea of Trademark Factory that I'm gonna tell you a little bit more later today. And uh, that was in 2013. And uh, as the Trademark Factory business grew, uh, as it picked up, I realized that I can't grow it if I continue to hold on to my Canadian lawyer license. So three years ago, I actually gave up my Canadian lawyer license, something that I worked so hard for, to be able to scale international uh, Trademark Factory internationally. And uh, that's probably been one of the biggest steps out of my comfort zone and one of the best decisions I've ever made. I'm a best-selling author of five books. Um, two of them in Russian, three of them are in English. And uh, kind of my biggest one is the, the Ultimate Insider's Guide to Intellectual Property, where I explain the property uh, in a language that a nine-year-old would understand. Now, enough about me, let's talk about you. And uh, before we move on, what I'm gonna share with you is actually very, very, very powerful. Can be, and like everything that can, that's very powerful, it can be used for both good and bad. So I need you to promise to me that you're not gonna use the powers that I'm gonna share with you for evil. What's happening? I hope everyone else uh, promises they won't use these powers for evil as well. Yeah. All right, okay. cool. So my challenge for you really is try to think of one successful business without thinking of its brand. And let me make it easy for you. You can't because the brand is what we think about when we're thinking of a successful business. Now, if you had an unlimited budget and all other things being equal, including the price, which would you buy? Would you buy Chanel branded glasses or no name, no name glasses? I can't see the chat. That's so, so, so Omar, you, you, yeah, go ahead and you guys, um, uh, can you repeat the question? And yeah, so if you, had, you have an unlimited budget, which would you buy? Would you buy Chanel branded glasses or no name glasses? Like if you needed glasses. So uh, Melody said definitely Chanel. <laughs> right. Same question, right? With, with, with apparel, would you buy branded apparel or no name apparel? Would you buy you know, absolute vodka or <laughs> no name vodka? <laughs> right oh actually this one uh this one i actually would like the participation because it's funny now again if you had an unlimited budget all other things being equal uh would you get yourself a ferrari or a lamborghini i got some lambos Melody says, doesn't, don't know enough about them. Okay. Actually, Melody spoiled this for me because <laughs> that's, the, that's the only right answer. But usually when I do this presentation you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big room, there's always a lot of hands. And then I ask, well, how many of you have driven both to be able to have a meaningful decision, to make a meaningful decision? Because the way, so Omar, have you driven both? So I saw you no, prefer one no. both. You haven't, so, but you still have a preference. Interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what the brand does. That's the power of the brand. And I remember, so I had a chance to test drive them both a few years ago. And uh, I loved driving Lamborghini a lot better than a Ferrari. But everything in my mind was telling me to, that I have to prefer Ferrari because of all the legendary history behind them. And it was just such, a, such an interesting <laughs> brain game that I, that I had with, you know, yeah. Now, so moving on, how many of you think prefer uh, iPhones to Samsung phones? 
How many of you prefer Samsung phones to, to iPhones? So Melody prefers Samsung. Okay, so let me ask you, Melody, how often do you regularly, uh, and, and Omar, Samsung, okay, so how many of you guys regularly check press releases from Apple about their new upcoming phones? I don't check in. Yeah, you don't check them because you don't care because you're loyal to Samsung. Mm -hmm. Same thing with iPhone people. They don't care what Samsung is about to put up. So there you go. The lesson here is that brand is important. What I've been doing for the last couple of years, I'm posting comments on, days, on daily news that has something to do with uh, trademarks. So here are just a few headlines. Louis Vuitton sues fried chicken restaurant with similar logo. Van City Buzz rebrands shortly after BuzzFeed Canada's trademark is approved. So Van City Buzz used to be the biggest online news aggregator in Canada. They had been building the brand for eight years. They had hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And then BuzzFeed got their Canadian trademark approved and uh, that was the end of Van City Buzz brand. They had to rebrand to what's now Daily Hive. And in the process, they lost a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of subs subscribers. University of Houston System files trademark infringement lawsuit against South Texas College of Law over a similar logo. You would think that South Texas College of Law might have somebody, maybe a lawyer, I don't know, who would tell them that it's not generally a good idea to steal a logo from a competing law school. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Citigroup sues AT&T for trademark infringement over the words, thank you. Sweetie Pie's owner, Susie's own son, alleging trademark infringement at his restaurant. Sorry, Manchester United, Jose Mourinho is a registered trademark of Chelsea Football Club. So this one is uh, also pretty funny. So uh, Manchester United signed a contract with Jose Mourinho to be their coach. And then they realized that they couldn't use his name in their marketing materials because that was trademarked by the club he used to be a coach for previously. Brewery changed his name for second time in two years because of trademark dispute. You would think the first time around they had to change their name, they would pick a name that they could actually own, but no. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> this one, I love it. <clears throat> George Clooney sells his tequila brand for $1 billion. Five years ago, he came up with a name for a tequila brand. First thing he did, he went out and he trademarked it. The name was Casamigos. Then a year later, he found a distiller in Mexico to actually make the darn thing. And uh, it got reasonably successful. So much so that last year he was bought up, the brand was bought up by Diageo for $1 billion. He practically printed a billion dollars out of thin air. So the lesson here is that brands matter to business of all sizes and of all industries. Now, when I started my business, my law firm, the lesson that I learned the hard way is that if you've got no customers, you've got no business. This is the photograph from the opening day in Moscow when McDonald's opened their doors for the first time. They had 30,000 people on their opening day. Now, how many would love to have 30,000 hungry, hungry clients on the day you opened your business? The only re reason they were so successful is because of those golden arches. It's the brand that brought all those people to line up and stand for hours and wait for the amazing opportunity to try their Big Mac for the first time. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, I came up with this idea that I call a matrix of success. There's really two things you need to be successful in your business. You need a lot of people to know you, that you exist, and they, you need a lot of people who know you to also want whatever it is that you're offering to them. And so this matrix of success basically has four, 
for options. The first option is when nobody knows you, but even if they did, they wouldn't want your stuff anyway. That's the type of business that Kevin O'Leary wants to take behind the barn and shoot. Now you also have a situation when a lot of people know you, but they still don't want whatever it is that you're offering. That's the new Coke scenario. The third scenario is when, in theory, people would like what you have. Uh, you, you're selling something that it's important that people buy, but nobody knows you. That's what creates all those desperate people in networking events when they desperately try to shove their business cards in your face. Oh, actually, that reminds me of, uh, <laughs> of a situation. So I had a, I was leading a, uh, I, I was giving a talk uh, at an event a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm done. I get off the stage. I have a lineup of people to ask me some questions. And uh, there's this woman at the end of the line. So finally, it's her turn. She comes up to me and says, Andre, I love the presentation. It was super, super uh, informational. So yeah, great. Would you have a question? And she says, yeah, I have a question. Say, so, well, well, what's your question? And she goes, Andre, I was wondering, do you have uh, life insurance? <laughs> so don't be, don't be that woman. Uh, and uh, the, last, the last category here is when a lot of people know you and they all want whatever it is that you're selling. That's where we all want to be. Jack Welch, the former CEO of General Electric, has once famously said, if you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. And uh, sad but true. So if you combine what he said with my matrix of success, really what you see is that your competitive advantage is having something in your business, whatever it is, that allows you to get more people to know you and want your product. Does that make sense? And by the way, I always finish uh, the phrase that Jack Walsh started. So he says, if you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. I always add, if you don't protect your competitive advantage, you don't have a competitive advantage because it's so easy to copy. So trademarks is what can help you build and maintain that competitive advantage. What I'm gonna share with you today is three secrets. One is that trademarks are a lot more than just your logo. Two is that it's often too late to trademark your brand, but never too early. And uh, you're also gonna learn why the cost of trademarking is really irrelevant. So secret number one, trademarks are a lot more than just your logo. A lot of people ask me, so Andre, which brand is it worth to have, a, which brands are worth to protect? So a brand, is worth protecting if it does at least one of those three things. If it helps your buyers find you, if it helps your buyers remember you, and if it compels your buyers to buy from you. Do you think Nike maybe sold a few extra t-shirts because they have, because they had uh, Just Do It on their t-shirts? That's why it's a powerful logo. So every single successful brand has three requirements has three elements that make it successful. One, it's memorable, right? If nobody can remember your brand, you don't have a valuable brand because that's something that your clients, people who have known you will be able to share with their friends. And notice that I said memorable. I didn't say it has to be super inventive. If you look at the list of top 100 brands, none of them really are super inventive, you know, Apple could have been just as successful if there were Mango, you know, Google, Microsoft, GE, like all of those are super memorable names. They're worth billions, but it's not that they've spent months and months trying to come up with that perfect name. Two, the name has to be connected to a viable business. If you've got a great name or a great logo, but you're selling something that nobody wants to buy, you don't have a valuable brand, uh, which again leads me to think of uh, Nike swoosh, right? It's been recognized as the most iconic logo of all times, but it's not a, you know, a wonderful, I mean, it's not a, it's not the most intricate work of art, is it? 
it, yet it's worth billions because the company that owns it sells millions of sneakers to millions of people every day, uh, every year. I don't know about every day, maybe. <laughs> uh, the last requirement of all successful brands is that they're well protected. If you have a great brand, great business, but you don't protect the brand, people are gonna start stealing your brand and you're not gonna have a valuable brand. And the important thing you're to understand here is that these three things, you have, to be, you have to do them simultaneously. It's not let me first come up with a memorable brand, then let me build a great business, then let me think about protecting it. You have to do all those things all at the same time. Now, here's my definition of a trademark, and don't expect a textbook definition. I'm going to give you a definition that makes sense. A trademark is anything that allows the market to tell your products and services apart from identical and similar products and services of everyone else. So think of your product or your service, even if it's a service, think of it as something that is put in a box, and that box is sitting on the shelf in a supermarket. And... Uh, now think that you've got a competitor, even if you don't have a competitor, think that you have one, who have completely ripped you off. They copied your product or your service exactly. It offers the same benefits, it has the same features, same characteristics, same price, same everything. So they put their product or service in another box that sits right next to yours. So a trademark is something that would allow me as a potential customer, as I walk by that shelf with those two boxes to tell your product or service apart from your competitors. Our own tagline is, if it's remarkable, it's trademarkable. And yeah, of course we trademark that. Really that's what trademarks are all about. It is something that makes you stand out. So because of that definition, really, there's two big rules. Your trademark cannot be too similar to someone else's trademark that covers the same or similar products and services, right? If you copy somebody else's brand, your trademark will not allow customers to tell your products apart from your competitors. So it would defeat the purpose. And the second uh, the second part of this is that it has to be for in connection with same or similar products and services. So McDonald's owns this tagline, I'm loving it, right? But they don't own the phrase, I'm loving it. They own the phrase, I'm loving it for restaurant services only. So if you were a funeral home or if you were a gynecologist, you could use the same phrase in your business. You could even trademark that and McDonald's wouldn't be able to do anything about it, right? Whether that's a great business decision or not, I'll leave up to you to decide. Now, the second rule out of that definition is that your trademark must do more than simply describe a feature or a characteristic of your product and services. Because the purpose of a trademark, again, is not to have you own the, the niche. It's not for you to have to own the product. It's for you to allow people to differentiate your product with, you, this, with a particular set of features from everybody else's products that may have the same set of characteristics or features. So there are five main things that you could trademark. And m most businesses don't need all five, but as you grow, probably you will. So one is the name. Uh, the, the first one is the name of the business, or Apple or McDonald's. The names of your products, the iPhone or Big Mac. Names of your services, iTunes or Mac Cafe. And by the way, sometimes the name of the business and the name of the service is one or the same thing. So Google is a good example for that. You also could tra trademark your logos and your taglines. And here's this other thing that I see used more and more, and I call it a trademarking growth hack. It's pretty cool. Ford used to run commercials. They all ended with, only Ford has EcoBoost fuel economy. Interestingly, they never bothered to tell you what EcoBoost actually was. They never told you what was better about it or what was even different about it from everyone else's engines. And 
the way the human mind is wired is whenever you tell people that you're the only one, when you're trying to sell something to them, when you tell them that I'm the only one who's got something, you automatically assume that it has to be good. You automatically assume it's got to be better than everyone else. And uh, so I, I see your question, Omar. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, actually, why don't I address it right now? So say if another brand can use your tagline, why bother getting it trademarked? Nobody can use your tagline for the same product and services or similar product and services. So I couldn't open a restaurant and say, I'm loving it and use the, the tagline, I'm loving it for it. Here's the difference between the copyright that protects the actual phrase uh, or the actual work of a literary work from trademarks because trademarks are about product and services. They're not just about the design. They're not just about the phrase. They're not just about the word, which is why uh, it really uh, pisses me off when people who don't understand how trademarks work, they say, well, how can you trademark a, a common name? Well, Apple is a common name. Right? Nobody can call their phones Apple, but you can sell apples and call them Apple. You can sell pens and call them Apple. You can sell staplers and call them Apple, maybe, right? depending on what Apple had trademarked. The, the point here is it's very important for, with trademarks to see, is there possibility that people who buy uh, a product from you or a service from you would be confused into believing that somebody else who's using the same or similar tagline or name or logo would think that their product comes from you, okay? So in, uh, in fact, here's a real life scenario. There's a trademark called Blue Shield. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's two different trademarks. One is owned by the medical insurance company so they sell medical insurance services under the name Blue Shield. And there's also a company that sells welding services under the same name, Blue Shield. And they're both allowed to have the same name, the same trademark, because nobody in their right mind would think that when, they're, when they go to buy medical insurance, they'd be buying it from the company that does welding and nobody would be buying welding services, thinking that they're actually buying them from the company that sells medical insurance. So if you can show that there is some confusion, then yes, you can expand your tagline to go you know, ab you know, above and beyond your own industry. But the point of the trademark is not to give you ownership of the phrase itself, only in combination with particular products and services. Okay, so going back to Ford and EcoBoost, they never bothered to tell you what it was, never bothered to tell you I was better or different. They never even bothered to tell you whether eco stood for economy or ecology. And uh, the only thing they really told you is that they were the only ones that had it. And the way they accomplished it, they trademarked the name. All, all EcoBoost was is the name. Here's another one, Chevron. Does anyone know what makes uh, Chevron unique? What does Chevron got that makes their gas different from everyone else? Type it in the chat. No, not just the name. They've got something else. They've got some super magical ingredient. Tecron, yes. Yes, we got it. Does anyone know what Tecron is? It's a name, it's just a name, that's what they've got. But everyone knows who, what it is, right? And again, people assume, or at least when they first came up with it, it was a big deal, right? Uh, people assume that this Tecron must somehow make the gas better. That's, that's the power of a trademark. Now, Starbucks uh, actually bought a company they had to buy a company that owned the brand uh, Frappuccino. And uh, they did this because they realized that they can't protect the recipe, they can't protect the idea of selling a cold coffee drink, 
And so what they did is they bought the brand and now they can say, well, yeah, of course we can serve cold coffee or frozen coffee or whatever it is, but you just can't call it Frappuccino. And by extension, they now own the, the industry. They own that niche. Now, I also wanted to come up with a fictional example that better explains how this process works. And I deliberately came up with a uh, situation where it's really difficult to show that whatever you're doing is unique, that's different from everyone else's. So I came up with mortgage with an example of a mortgage broker. Right? They all do the same thing. They all say, I'm personable. I am uh, going to be there for you when you need me. I'm not assigned to a particular bank. I'm going to find the best mortgage, blah, 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 blah. All the same thing. Now compare that to a mortgage broker that says, I am the only mortgage broker in North America who will find the best rates for your mortgage using our proprietary IHNC calculator. That immediately, if you're in the market for mortgages, raises some interest until you ask them, what does IHNC stand for? And it stands for, I have no clue. Again, it's a fictional example, but it demonstrates how it works. So there's four steps to using this trademarking growth hack. First, you identify a feature that's important to your market. And again, you don't have to have anything unique about that feature. Uh, you just have to figure out what it is. Two, you come up with a unique name for the feature. And the name cannot just describe the feature. It has to be something like Techron, <laughs> right? And then you trademark the name. And then you use that name everywhere. Use that in your website, you use it in your marketing materials, you use it on your business cards, you use it on your videos, you use it everywhere to tell people that that's what sets you apart from everyone else. That's your trademarking growth hack. So secret number two, it's often too late, but never too early to trademark your brand. And uh, this one is I'm really passionate about because I see a lot of mistakes made in this department. So a couple of years ago, I did some research to see when all the hottest startups filed their first trademark, right? Now that they're making billions of dollars, uh, it's, it's easy to know that, of course, they're trademarked up to, up to their yin yang. But my question was, when did they file their first one? And uh, the results are very telling. So Uber filed their first trademark two months before they launched. Stripe, eight months before they launched. Fire, uh, Firefox, two months before they launched. Google, same month as launch. Facebook, same month as launch. Periscope, same month as launch. And here's my favorite, Airbnb. They filed their first one while the founder was still renting out his own bedroom on Airbnb to pay for their overhead. All right, so they all did it before they were successful. They all did it before anybody knew who they were. They all did it before they were on anybody's radar. And the only reason they did it is because they believed that they could have the next big thing on their hands and they treated it as, as such. They, they protected it, which is why it really kills me when I see business owners who's like, well, who's going to steal my brand? And, uh, my response is always the same. If you don't think that you've got a brand that's worth stealing from you, you either have the wrong brand, the wrong business, or most probably both. And uh, as an illustration to that, I always give this example. Well, let's say somebody stole this brand from you and you had an opportunity to buy it back. They said, well, you can't use this name because it's ours, but we're open to, to letting you buy it back from us, would you? And if yes, for how much? And really, the, if, you, if your answer is, no, I don't care, I'm just gonna switch to a different name, uh, then that's not a brand worth trademarking, that's not a brand worth protecting, but most importantly, that's not a brand worth building. So you might as well go back to the drawing board and come up with a name that actually means something. So the question I get asked all the time is what does trademarking actually accomplish and why would you bother doing it? Well, other than 
you know, you'd be nuts not to. Uh, here are three reasons. First, it minimizes the risk of forced rebranding. It minimizes the risk of you one day receiving a letter from a law firm that says, it has come to our client's attention that you have been using our client's name or our client's logo, our client's tagline to sell your products or your services. And uh, this name is trademarked by our client and we hereby demand that you immediately rebrand, you have seven days, and that you pay our client everything you made under this brand in the last three years. If you've got your trademark first, the risk of that is almost zero. The second reason is that it minimizes the risk of customer confusion and cost of uh, trademark disputes. Um, today, people make their decisions based on online reviews. So if, let's say, somebody uses your name for their business, and let's say they, they offer inferior quality, people leave bad reviews, guess what's gonna happen when people search for your name and, for, and they see reviews about somebody else. They're gonna think that those bad reviews are also about you. And uh, that's on top of you just losing direct business because people who think they're buying from you are buying from somebody else. And as for cost of trademark disputes, that's a scenario with that demand letter or only the other way around. With a registered trademark, if you send a demand letter to the other side, chances are uh, they're going to listen and act very quickly. You might not get paid right away, but it's more than likely that they're gonna rebrand without you having to, to go to court. With an, without a registered trademark, the chances are they're, they're probably gonna ignore you because the first thing they're gonna do, they're gonna show that letter to their lawyer and the lawyer, the first thing they're gonna do, they're gonna check if you had trademarked your brand. And if you didn't, they're gonna go back to their client and say, you know what, they hadn't bothered to even trademark this. Uh, I don't see why they would spend 10, maybe 50 times more the cost of a trademark uh, to take you to court. And so they will just wait and ignore your letter. And third reason to get a trademark is that it allows you to build a valuable asset. Remember George Clooney? right, and his billion dollars, that's exactly what he did. First thing he did, he came, came, came up with a name, then he trademarked it. And then he sold the asset. Now, from the legal perspective, there are also three big benefits of trademark registration, and I'm gonna go from the least important to the most important. So in North America, unlike in the rest of the world, where if you don't register your trademark, you don't have any rights to your brand, so in Canada and US, you do have some limited protection to your brand if you can prove that a lot of people know about your product and services under your brand in a particular geographical uh, area where somebody else is trying to hijack that name from you. But that implies that you have to have a lot of people know about you under that brand. By definition, you can't protect a name before it becomes known unless you file a trademark. That's why Uber, that's why Stripe, you know, all of those companies filed their trademark before they launched because they wanted to protect the name before it becomes widely known. Also, the, uh, the benefit is that protection is federal. It's not an international, but it covers you throughout the country, even if nobody's ever heard of you in some remote area. So for example, if you run a restaurant in LA, um, it's perfectly legal unless you have a, a registered trademark. It's perfectly legal for somebody in New York to open the restaurant with exactly the same name. You can't go after them unless you file a trademark. But if you do file a trademark, the trademark is federal. So then you can go against that New York restaurant. And again, think of the uh, online reviews. That's why it's so important. And uh, the reason number one is that a registered trademark creates the presumption of validity and ownership. What that means is that if you, have, if you don't have a registered trademark and you have a dispute in court, you're probably gonna spend an extra 50, $70,000 on 
experts, witnesses, uh, lawyers, uh, surveys that will prove to the judge that your brand is known to a sufficient number of people in that geographical area where you claim you've got a brand. And uh, really there's nothing, nothing more expensive in a courtroom than having to prove that, prove, prove something, right? And with, with trademarks, it's about proving the, that you've got a brand. If you have a registered trademark, all you have to do is produce one piece of paper that says that you have a certificate of registration because now you're presumed to own a trademark and that the trademark is valid. Now, if the other side disagrees, now they have to spend 50 to 70 K on their lawyers, on their experts, on their witnesses, on their surveys uh, to prove to the judge that uh, your trademark is, is either invalid or that you don't own it. And in any litigation, you want to be, the side that sits there and just waits and watches the other side burn through their cash. Now this question I get asked all the time, I say, well, Andre, of course you're in a trademarking business and now you're going to tell everyone needs to get a trademark. And actually, no, there are, there are the, there's two legitimate reasons not to get a trademark. The first reason is if you plan to rebrand, in the next year or two, or you plan to go out of business, or maybe it's a very temporary thing, but kind of a fad, uh, then you don't need to get a trademark because trademarking is a long process. It takes about 14 to 18 months on average. And uh, if you don't plan to be in business under this brand, by the time you get that trademark, there's no point in getting it. And by the way, here's the, uh, in the animation, you're seeing a scene from, uh, the movie The Founder is probably one of the most powerful scenes about branding. Uh, it's when uh, McDonald's brothers have signed off the name to uh, Ray Kroc and they're watching the sign taken away and this is seeing the transformation of the, one of the most valuable brands out there to just a 15 cent burger. And the second reason not to get a trademark is uh, if you treat your business as a hobby, if you, treat, if you treat your business as something that's local, if people only find you because they know you personally, you don't want to grow, you, you want to, you know, if you're super local, you don't want to uh, expand. At that point, the, the brand really is not doing uh, much for you. You don't need to get a trademark in that situation. But if you are growth minded, uh, it's something you should look into for sure. Now, secret number three, that trademarking is neither expensive nor inexpensive. The cost of trademarking is really irrelevant. So Coca-Cola filed their first trademark in 1892. That was the year when they were selling nine drinks a day. I call it a lemonade stand with a dream. And, uh, do you think they care how much they pay their lawyers back then now that their brand, just the brand itself is worth more than $73 billion, right? Even if they overpaid their lawyers by, lawyers by a factor of a thousand, it still would have been the best investment they've ever made. Now compare that to Carhu. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering what Carhu is, it's a brand that uh, was designed to be a competitor to Uber. And after they burned through quarter billion dollars, $250 million, they, got, they went bust. So a dollar that they paid to trademark the brand was a dollar too much. So it's not about the cost, it's about what you do with that brand after. And to that point, I wanna give you a quote from Ray Kroc he said, you're not going to get it free. You have to take risks. And in some cases, you must go for broke. If you believe in something, you've got to be in it to the ends of your toes. Taking reasonable risks is part of the challenge. It's the fun. Right? That's what we do. That's why we start businesses. That's why we come up with brands. That's why we try to build those brands. And that's why we spend our time, money, and energy trying to build those up. So when you're asking me, Andre, is my brand worth trademarking? Really what you're asking me is, is my business worth building? Only you can answer that question. 
Okay, so Omar's got a great question. Why do you have a name that you've had for years, but someone else trademarks it? Could they take you out of business? That's precisely why I asked you in the beginning of this presentation to promise to me that you're not going to use these powers for evil. So to answer Omar's question, by law, if you started your business, you've had this for name for years, by law, you should be able to win in a litigation against somebody else who trademarks that name. The problem is, it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg. So often what happens is that the business that you've been running under that name for years just does not wanna end up spending all this money. So in, in uh, Canada, a couple of years ago, we actually had the exact same situation. There was a company, a floor, uh, there was uh, a flooring company uh, named uh, Woodpecker Flooring. Okay. They were there for 20 years. They had never bothered to trademark their brand. And uh, then another company popped up literally across the street from that flooring company. And uh, they did exactly what, what you're saying. They trademarked the brand and then they had the balls to go after the, the old company and say, na 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 we trademarked this brand and now you have to change the name. And uh, so the old company was having none of that. They took the old company, uh, the new company to court uh, and uh, they ended up winning. And then the new company took it to the appeal and uh, the old company again won on the appeal. So yes, they could win, but I can guarantee you that they spent more than $125,000 on that. And I can guarantee you that they had not recovered those costs. So can you win uh, if somebody else trademarks your brand? Yes. Uh, is it going to you know, be a good investment to see if somebody tries to steal it rather than protect it at, at the outset? No. Does that make sense? Cool. So if there's one thing that I want you to get out of this presentation today, it's not that you should immediately you know, go and trademark your brand. It's not that. What I do want you to get out of this today is that your brand and your business are not worthless. Today, we have a lot of people who keep saying, oh, ideas are worthless, execution is everything. It's bullshit. I mean, yes, an unexecuted idea has very little value, but why would you execute an idea that's worthless? Think about that. So if you're thinking, how do I trademark my brand? There's a few options. First, you can do it yourself. And uh, I can guarantee you that each and every one of you on this webinar is smart enough to file your own trademarks. The real question is, is it worth your time to learn all the ins and outs of doing it properly? So I'm going to give you an analogy. Well, actually, before I give you the analogy, let me, let me uh, quickly walk you through what the trademarking process entails. First, you do the search, then you draft the application, then you file the application, then you hope that it's approved. But in 65% of the cases, it won't be approved. You're going to get an office action. And if you don't respond to that office action, your trademark is going to die in painful death. But if you do respond to that office action, it's going to be approved. And after it's approved, it's going to be published for opposition purposes. And then 99% is going to be allowed. But in the 1% of the case, it will be posed with somebody who's going to say, please don't give this trademark to the, uh, the, to the, to the applicant. And if you fail to respond to the opposition, your trademark is going to die a painful death. And if you do succeed in the application, in the opposition proceedings, your trademark will be allowed. And from there, you have to file a statement of use and that's when your trademark finally gets registered that's when you put that trademark certificate on your wall you celebrate you pour yourself a glass of tequila that's not it you still have to take care of watching if somebody's trying to file a similar trademark you have to take care of renewals every 10 or 15 years depending on the country you have to take care of all the amendments of your business name or your address so all of that so like i said each and every one of you can do that by yourselves the problem is the time. Like everyone knows how to drive, well, most people know how to drive and most people have spent 
at least several weeks to learn how to drive or at least how to drive well. The question is, now that we're driving every day, it's so convenient. You go in your car, it takes you from point A to point B. That investment of your time is totally worth it. But what if you knew before you decided to take your driving test? What if you knew that you'd only drive once in your lifetime? You'd say, screw that, I'm just taking an Uber, <laughs> right? Same thing with trademarks. So the second option is to use uh, other law firms and online filing companies, and they're gonna get it done for you with varying degrees of success. The problem with that option is that they're gonna have a price tag on each and every one of these steps. So that's how your $300 file can easily become a $5,000, 10000 sometimes even $15,000 process because you don't know what's going to happen with your trademark application. They do, you don't. So I knew there had to be a better way. That's how I came up with this idea of Trademark Factory. So what we did is we became the only firm in the world that offers trademarking services with a predictable result for a predictable budget. What we do, well, we start with each and every one of our packages, we have three, starts with a free comprehensive trademark search. So after you purchase our services, the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna check if your brand is trademarkable. And if it isn't, if it has some problems, you can get all your money back. Essentially, that becomes free. Or if you move forward, at least you, you know what's out there and what the chances are. Because the last thing you wanna do is wait for 14, 18 months and then to find out that, whoops, I can't have it. We also have a single all-inclusive flat fee for our services, which means that you pay once and you now never see another invoice from us. And also, we have a 100% money back guarantee. If we do the search, we'll tell you your trademarks are registrable and the trademarks office issues a refusal, you get all your money back. We're the only firm in the world that does this. So that's what our all-inclusive package covers, covers all of those things. And uh, it's uh, $29.95 plus government fees that vary from country to country. And uh, where it says plus tax, you don't pay tax unless you're a Canadian resident. So it's 3K for the all-inclusive package. And if you're wondering what that is, if you break it down, so a trademark is good for 10 years and then you renew it for another 10 and then you renew it for another 10 and another 10 and another 10. That's how Coca-Cola ended up renewing the same trademark since 1892. Trademarks is the only type of intellectual property that you can renew forever. So most countries it's 10 years, Canada is currently 15 years. So if you break it down, that 3K, it's basically less than a cup of coffee. In fact, it's 68 cents. It's less than that much coffee a day. Um, and we think that 68 cents a day is a pretty good deal to protect your brand. But when we were pre preparing for this uh, webinar, this guy said, uh, no, that's not good enough. You have to give them something better. Right, Omar? Yes. And so we came up with something better than that which is this. If you go to freetmsearch.com forward slash infopreneur and you fill out that form and you get the process started, what you're gonna get is in addition to the all-inclusive package, you're gonna get one year free of weekly confusion watch service. What that is is if somebody, every week we're gonna be checking to see if someone files a trademark similar to yours, and if they do, we'll notify you so that we can nip it in the bud if it's something that affects your interest in the brand. So you're gonna, typically that's $39 a month or $468 a year. So you're gonna get that. You also get a signed copy of my best selling book, The Ultimate Insider's Guide to Intellectual Property, signed and shipped. And uh, you're gonna get not one, not two, not three, you're gonna get four contract templates that I wrote 
uh, for my clients. They paid me over $11,000 for it. You again get the copyright assignment agreement. By the way, how many of you know that when you hire a web designer to do your website or when you hire a videographer to do your video or when you hire a photographer to do your photographs, even if you pay them, unless you have an agreement in writing with them that says you own the, the photograph, you own the website, you own the, uh, the video, you don't own them, they do. They own copyright and they can limit your ability to use that video, that photograph, that website. So this contract template takes care of all those things that you had created for you before, now you figured it out, you can go back to them and buy and, and, and ensure that uh, you document properly the transfer of IP. You also get the content creation agreement. Uh, so the first one is just a one pager because it's a lot easier to, to, to sign, to have them sign a short agreement after, you've, after they've taken your money than uh, the other way around. So the content creation agreement is what you will sign before you hire somebody in the future. Right? It has a lot more details. It has a lot more provisions uh, that, again, it's a lot easier to have them sign a longer agreement before they took your money than after. You get a non-disclosure agreement. And uh, there's a lot of free non-disclosure agreements you can find online. The problem with them is that they only take care of non-disclosure. They don't take care of non-use. Whereas with most of us, the biggest concern when we disclose our secret to an investor, for example, is not that they're going to disclose it. It's not that they're going to publish it. It's that they're going to run away with your idea. And so the, those free non-disclosure agreement templates that you can easily find online, they don't take, take care of that. So I've written uh, a contract that takes care of both non-disclosure and non-use. A client paid us $2,500 for it. Uh, and then you're going to get a trademark license agreement. So when you've built your brand enough to have somebody else want to use that for, for their business, maybe you're branching out, right? You want to grow uh, and expand. That's what you can use. Now, the, the total value, and I've been paid $11,000 total for, for these contracts. You're going to get all that. And you're going to get all that for free as part of the deal if you move ahead with filling out that form at freetmsearch.com forward slash infopreneur. And uh, you're actually not going to pay $29.95. You're going to pay $24.95 plus tax plus government fees. Again, thank uh, this guy over there. <laughs> uh, he, he made that possible for you. So the government fees, by the way, I'm, I keep bringing them up. They differ from country to country. They differ from how you file your trademark, they differ from how many goods and services your trademark uh, covers. That's something we're gonna work on with you as we work on your trademark application. Now, you may be thinking, and, and by the way, Omar, can, can, can you help me out with this? Let, let's say, uh, why don't you read out the questions that I'm gonna be bringing up so I answer to you and not just talk to myself, okay? Can we do that? Yeah, sure. All right. But Andre, I don't have a brand yet. Yeah, no, we get that all the time, especially at big events that I do. Uh, so we thought of that. So when you go to this, um, to the page, uh, freetmsearch.com forward slash infopreneur, you'll see a, a video of Queen singing, I want it all, I want it now. Uh, so you can click there and it will pre-populate the fields and the form that basically says future brand and you're gonna have a whole year to come up with an unlimited number of names for us to check until you find the one that you wanna do. So you prepay, but you have a whole year to actually take advantage of that offer. And you can send us you know, any number of, well, any reasonable number of names for us to check uh, to, un until you find the name that you like or the logo that you like or the tagline that you like. We're gonna to check to see if they're trademarkable and when you find the name that's, that you like and that's trademarkable, that's the one you're going to go for. But Andre, what if it's problematic? Yeah, so if we do the search and we realize that the brand that you really want is uh, 
either impossible to get or difficult to get, uh, we'll report that back to you within two business days. And you're going to have three options. Your first option will be to file it anyway with less than 100% money back guarantee. So it's only relevant for businesses who've been around for a long time and uh, that don't plan to rebrand and really need to get this particular brand. Uh, that's something we'll look into. That, that'll be your, your, your call whether you want to still try it with less than 100% money back guarantee. Your second option would be come up with a different brand. Again, you have a whole year to come up with a, any number of variations for us to check to make it more trademarkable. And your third option will be to get a full refund. So if you say, you know what, Andre, that's the one I wanted. Doesn't look like it, that, that I'm going to get it. Can I just get my money back? And I'm going to say, yeah, that's easy. And you get all your money back. All right. No questions asked. And but Andre, where should I file my trademark? Yeah, so the where is a good question because trademarks, remember, they're done on a per country basis. So the typical scenario, the first thing you want to do is you want to trademark in your home country. And uh, then you also need to look at where a substantial amount of revenue comes from, right? It's not just about where you are, it's about where your customers are because you will need to be protecting the markets. And, and that really will depend on the uh, scale of your revenue, right? So the, the more money you make, the more important it becomes to trademark your brand in, in the markets that generate at least some amount. But generally, if you're you know, making up to you know, up to a million dollars a year in annual revenue. Basically, what you want to do is you want to trademark your brand everywhere uh, that's generating you more than 10% of your revenue. All right. So if you're based in the US uh, and let's say 15% of your business is in Canada or 15% of your business is in the EU, uh, that's where you also want to get that brand protected. And you know, if you make $100 million dollars then that 10%, you know, starts going down to you know, 5%, 3%, because that's, that's where uh, you just look at the numbers. So we can help you with this offer uh, to get your brand trademark in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia. And but Andre, I don't have the money. Yeah, that's the one we get all the time, but that really takes me back to this slide, right? If you are running a business that you're trying to grow, a trademark, trademarking is not just a fancy addition to your business, it's a necessary investment and it's just 68 cents a day. And uh, honestly, I don't know one single serious business that cannot afford that. But uh, we decided to make that e even easier for you. And like I said, instead of 3K, you're paying 2,500 and you can pay that in installments. You could break it into three or six monthly payments. And we're not gonna wait for the last payment to go through. We're gonna start working on after the first one is in. It does make it a little bit more expensive, but if uh, that's what it takes for you to make that decision and get your brand protected, we're gonna make that happen for you. So really that's all I got for you. Uh, you know, we're not Jim Simmons. And if, even if we were, we still couldn't trademark the air that we breathe, but we all can and probably should trademark the brands that we try to develop, that we try to build and we try to tell the world about. So again, one last thing I'm gonna leave you with uh, before we get to Q and A uh, is that if your brand is worth promoting, it's worth protecting. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andre. That was freaking awesome. <laughs> um, let me check with you guys. Do you guys have any questions for Andre? Go ahead and put it in the chat box. Or if you want to unmute yourself, you can do that. Um, and I, I suggest asking questions related to your business and your particular uh, goals and your needs. You know, Andre, he has worked with the biggest and the, big, and the biggest and the best brands in the world, uh, but he's also very humble and grounded and he is very approachable and helpful for uh, startups, people like yourselves, anyone 
at all. So he's here to help you. Um, right now, I suggest asking anything you want to ask about your business and trademarking. So Melody asks, um, do you work with copywriting uh, written materials? Okay, good question. Uh, I used to, uh, not anymore for two reasons. One is, uh, as I said, I gave up my lawyer license. Uh, but second, uh, with copyrights, it's super easy to, uh, to file your own copyright applications. It's almost something you cannot mess up even if you wanted to, right? With trademarks, um, there's a ton of moving parts. There's a ton of variables. There's a ton of uh, things you can do wrong. With copyright, honestly, you don't need help. You just go to the government website, uh, depending on the country where you want to do it. Uh, and by the way, if you're based in Canada, um, Canadian reg copyright registration is really dumb in the sense that they don't even require you to deposit the work. All they do is ask you, what's the name of the work? And uh, that's what gets uh, copyrighted. And uh, that's why we always recommend for Canadians uh, to do both Canada and U.S. because U.S. does require you to deposit the work with the Library of Congress. And uh, uh, it does, uh, you, you do all that through that form. But uh, so Melody, um, like I said, with, with copyright, there's almost no way you can mess this up. Right, you go to copyright.gov uh, and uh, you just follow the follow, follow the prompts. Uh, as far as I remember, these couple of years ago, it was like thirty-five dollars government fees uh, per per work to uh, to get it done. And the the form is horrible. Uh, <laughs> the, the the interface is bad, but uh, the software behind that form is good enough to not let you make mistakes put it that way right on awesome all right uh, on that note I want to ask uh, so with like copywriting um, what, what's the what's the uh, the purpose of using the copywriting uh, protection versus trademarking okay so let me give you a good example for from my practice with uh, JK Rowling um, she owns copyright in the text in the book okay uh, so copyright protects the story copyright protects uh, the sequence of words that she put on paper and so what I used to do for her uh, while I was still in working for that biggest international law firm in Russia uh, when she published uh, her next book uh, she sold the rights to a Russian publishing house so they could translate it into Russian and sell the book in Russian. Okay. And what was happening is that there was a lot of unauthorized translations popping up. So enthusiasts who loved Harry Potter and who, knew English and Russian enough, uh, they were creating their own translation of Harry Potter into Russian and they were publishing it for free on the web. And so my job was to go after them and because basically they were uh, killing the opportunity of Rush, the official publisher to make money. And so if they couldn't make money, then J.K. Rowling couldn't have make money selling the license. So we were going against dozens of those uh, Russian websites. And so what they were infringing is the copyright of J.K. Rowling in the text because translating the work in another language is another exclusive right of a exclusive copyright of uh, uh, an author. Now compare that with a trademark on the word Harry Potter on the Harry Potter logo, okay? So just because I wrote the book about Harry Potter does not give me the right to the name Harry Potter because short words or short phrases cannot be protected by copyright. Copyright requires something more substantial, okay? Uh, at least a few sentences. 
So by the way, when you send emails, they are protected by copyright because that's what, you know, well, un unless it's a very brief email that says, you know, okay. <laughs> but, but if you actually write, a t write something that's several paragraphs, that's protected by copyright, so nobody else can publish it. That's uh, copyright infringement. So, but nobody can slap the name Harry Potter on their books, on their T-shirts, on their movies, on the nothing because of the trademark that is owned. So that's the difference. Gotcha. All right. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, um, Andre, um, <clears throat> well, actually, we have another question here, real quick. Uh, this is I have. This is from Melody. I have a model that I will be teaching. Is that mm -hmm. something that should be trademarked or copyrighted? Okay. Let me see if I can get the the camera to work because there's something okay. I want to show. There yes, it worked. Magic. Right. Hang on. Give me a second. All right. And uh, as an example, she's saying like the cash flow quadrant. All right. So one of the books that I have written, actually my la latest book, uh, is called From Faces to Legendary, The Ultimate Insider's Guide to Intellectual Property for Coaches, Mentors, Trainers, and Consultants. Okay. And uh, it's funny that uh, Melody mentions the the quadrant because I mentioned in the book too. Same with what Tony Robbins did. Same with, you know, what this book is about basically is how coaches, mentors, trainers, and consultants, pretty much anyone who sells their wisdom to the masses uh, should use intellectual property to, uh, uh, to get the best out of their business. And, uh, so copyright would protect the content, but really content is not what people buy when they buy whatever it is that you're teaching, right? That's all in my book and uh, you, you, you can get that on, on Amazon. Um, because pretty much everything that anybody can teach anybody is out there for free on YouTube. It's out there for free on Google, right? It's not the wisdom that people are buying. What people are buying is the certainty that you can take them from point A to point B. It's the certainty that you can take them from their current hell to whatever dream they got in front of them. And the way you show them the certainty is by showing them that you've got a system, that it's not just a bunch of smart things that you can share with them uh, as you come to think about them, is that you have a system that has helped a bunch of people before. And now it's going to help you. Uh, but think about this. You ain't got the system unless the system's got a name, at least in the consumer's mind. And you ain't got the name unless that name is protected. So that's why you protect the names of those systems. That's why you protect the names of those programs. You protect them through, through trademarks. Copyright, you copyright books, yes. Uh, you copyright videos if you sell videos uh, as courses. Um, but the important thing is protect the branding for, for those names. So think about this. Um, and I actually want to go back to uh, Melody's point about, where is it? Here. About the cash flow quadrant that Robert Kiyosaki came up with. He knew he couldn't protect the idea that there's four types of income, you know, employee, self-employed, business, and investment. He knew that all this information is out there. He knew that he didn't invent it. So what he did is he created a graphical representation of that idea. He gave it a name and he trademarked the symbol. So now, Anybody can talk about this. Oh, there's different types of income, but nobody can use the cash flow quadrant because he, that's what he owns, but he owns it as a trademark. So same thing you can do if you've got, and like I said, all, all of this is in this book. It's like hundred pages long. Like you can read it in one city. Um, um, and, and, and by the way, you, 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 again, if you don't want the big book, which is here, which 
which you get as part of the deal, you just tell me to, to replace that with, the, with this and I can send that to you. Um, awesome. so, so like I said, the, the, the whole idea is you need to be very strategic about why you're doing this, right? Trademarks, copyright, patents, all of that is not the goal. It's not the end. It's the means to an end. And the end is how do I build a successful business that a lot of people know about and that they want whatever it is that I'm offering to them. By getting a trademark certificate on the wall is great, and I've got a ton of them. But what, I mean, it gives you the certainty that you're, you're for real. You know, a lot of people who, who've done this with us say, well, when I got this, you know, it felt like an important milestone because now I knew that I actually have a real business, right? Uh, all of that is, is great, but the real reason you're doing it is to get your business to the next level of success so that you can actually uh, go to people and say, I've got a proprietary system, right? So uh, you could have, you know, I'm, I'm just making, the, make, making this up, right? If you say, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a coach, I'm a life coach, I can help you, you know, do whatever. There's thousands of them, there's tens of them. You go to a networking event, <laughs> at least a quarter of people are life coaches. Right. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, you know, being arrogant here, it's just the reality. But if you say, I, you know, I'm the only life coach who uses a rainbow and lollipop system to, you know, to take you from point A to point B. Again, as silly as it sounds, it does something to your mind. You're like, oh, well, okay. Tell me more about the system. Now you're right? different. Now you're neat. You're, now you're, and, and like I said, it doesn't make any logical sense, but humans are not logical. I mean, they are, they are but not always. <laughs> so uh, that's why it's so important to protect those names. That's why I'm important to come up with those names first. Uh, and uh, for all that's holy, don't come up with names that are descriptive or generic. So don't, don't, you know, don't be, make it something like, you know, successful you or you know great life right it has to be something that yeah it has to convey an idea but it also has to put you apart from everyone else who does the same thing because you want to have something that makes it so easy for you to say only ford has eco boost fuel economy mm -hmm. even if it means nothing does that make sense it does to me it's great. Cool. And uh, on a note, are you, are, you, are, uh, are people allowed to use, this will be kind of like the final question, by the way, because uh, I know you got to go. Um, so uh, are people allowed to use those trademark names if they give you credit? Like, let's say, you know, the cash flow quadrant from Robert Kiyosaki. Like, am I allowed to say that in a training or something? No. Great question. So mentioning somebody else's trademark is very different from using it to sell your own products and services. So I can, when I decide to sell my phone on Craigslist and I say I'm selling an Apple iPhone, I'm not infringing the rights of Apple, right? Mentioning somebody else's trademark or saying, Robert, like I didn't have to ask Robert's permission to do this. Hmm. I didn't, well, I, I, I had to give attribution because it was kind of the point, but the the idea behind it is that it's very trademark use is very different from the legal perspective is very different from mentioning somebody else's trademark so when you uh mention something like this in your course it's okay but if your entire course like if you're let's, let's say if you had uh, uh, let's say if you have a landing page and right to the next to the buy buy button you had a big paragraph that says Omar is going to teach you what the cash flow quadrant is really all about, and you had the, the logo, that would be a problem. Right? So the the point is that uh, you can't create the perception that you are authorized by them to use the brand or that you are using it on their behalf. Right? So when I'm selling my phone on, off Craigslist. I'm not saying that I'm Apple's authorized dealer. I'm just saying I have, I used, to, you know, I just happen to have a phone that I want to, that I want to sell. Like same with you. Uh, when you say, 
uh, well, there's this, this, and in, in the middle of it, you say, um, it's, it's uh, you know, Robert Kiyosaki came up with this great concept, and he talks about this, 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 and you'll go buy his book. Uh, again, you're not trying to say that you are working for Robert Kiyosaki. You're not trying to say that Robert Kiyosaki uh, is going to, you know, show up next on stage and teach, mm -hmm. right? You're just mentioning it. That's okay. But if you're trying to create a perception that uh, you are Robert Kiyosaki <laughs> or uh, that you, you know, own his company, that's when you get into, uh, get into the problem. So, uh, Melody. Blah, 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 blah. So fair use works for copyright. Uh, again, as, as long as you're not um, negatively affecting their ability to make money using their works, which is why it's called fair. Uh, with trademarks, it's actually different. Uh, tra 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 trademarks and fair use are two separate things. And uh, even if you don't know that it's somebody else's trademark, but it is somebody else's trademark, they can still go after you, right? Uh, the question is, are you doing something that stops, that creates an idea that confuses the consumer into believing that they're not dealing with you, but into believing that they're dealing with them? If you've got that confusion, that's enough for you to be found to, to, uh, to, to be infringing their trademark. Gotcha. All right. All right, guys. Well, uh, I'm going to, we're going to wrap it up now. Um, Andre, thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for sharing all these words of wisdom and, uh, helping us with our, you know, navigate through this, you know, treacherous pitfall of, uh, of, of all these loopholes all, all over the, uh, business, the legal business world. And, helping us protect ourselves, you know, from, uh, getting screwed over in the future. <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad I've been a part of this. And, uh, if, uh, somebody learned something useful, that's great. Thanks. You're very welcome. And, uh, those of you watching the recording, you know, make sure you go to that link free tm search.com forward slash infopreneur. I'll put the link below the video. Uh, so you can get your free trademark search hundred percent free. And you can also reach out to Andre if you have any questions. Um, he has his, uh, I'll put his uh, contact info below the video as well. Um, you can also check out trademarkfactory.com. Check out the, uh, the website, see, learn more about the services it really is a great service. And, uh, it's all over. It's, it's in uh, multiple places around the world in Europe and U S and Canada and, uh, Australia, right? Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Australia as well. So, all right. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Thanks again, everyone really appreciate you all being here. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Bye, uh, see you, Andre. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Cheers.